ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Hey guys, uh, obviously extremely disappointed with that result. Yeah, pretty shattering to be honest, uh, but I just wanted to jump on here and um, give a heartfelt uh, thank you. A sombre Isaac Heaney resigning himself to his fate of checks notes, a one-game suspension. Hey, to be fair, it will mean a possible Brownlow goes begging. But is there a level of Heaney hypocrisy? Corbin Middlemass is going to prosecute the case. We will also preview the weekend action in the AFL while in the NRL. The Bunnies and the Finns played the Wayne Bennett Cup. We've also got a killer edition of Soundbites on Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. Seven rounds remaining in the AFL season and here to preview. Round 18 is Corbin Middlemass. Corb, just to quickly touch on Isaac Heaney first. His one-game ban upheld despite the Swans' appeal. His overly grave statement was giving real hostage vibes, which kind of fits because his Brownlow is hostage to this suspension. Where are you on this? It feels like we've kind of had a hard time with champions getting rubbed out. I think one week's about right, to be honest. I, I don't think you can turn around, bop someone in the nose, cause a, a bloodied nose to Jimmy Webster as what we saw happen, and then that's just play on in, in modern footy. Can they peg one back here, the Swans? Heaney got rid of Webster behind the play. Jimmy Webster's picking himself up. Heaney's giving him a, a really good flick from behind. Heaney actually stopped. Heaney stopped to say, oh, you OK? Yeah, it sucks for Isaac, and it's it's disappointing that, you know, if he polls the most votes on Brownlow medal night, he's not going to win. We haven't seen that for, for 27 years where there's been uh, a player poll the most votes and be ineligible. So, in a way, I hope for Isaac's case that now he doesn't poll the most votes and we're, we're able to avoid that. But... I didn't see any way around this suspension. Yeah, the Swans did their <laughs> did their very best to try and get him off. I think they did make a couple of errors, including at the appeals board, which for people to try and understand this, you, you're not getting a second opinion at the appeals board. Basically, what you're arguing there is that there has yeah, been a breakdown in the, the justice system and the way that it should have been carried out with the evidence presented. And I don't think they made that point as well as what they um, probably needed to. And as a result, he's he's going to miss again. The, the part that probably gets to me a little bit is the Swans were sort of very outspoken about, you know, head trauma when their players were involved. So we saw, you know, Tom McCartan and Paddy McCartan, obviously they had, you know, very real world examples of that. Um, we saw Harry Cunningham concussed by Peter Wright on field earlier in the year and the, the Swans were strong that, hey, we, we don't want this kind of thing in the game and sort of speaking almost on the broader footy community about, you know, split second incidents on the field, one against the Giants with Callum Brown and the other against the Bombers with, uh, with Peter Wright. We're very much doing doing as much as we can as an industry to try and protect our players. And the game's moving forward all the time with legislation to be able to do that. And we're trying to educate our playing, our players as much as we can as far as how to, how to be uh, attack any contest there is in the, in the game. And yet now we've seen two incidents involving the Sydney Swans where Luke Parker picks off a player in the VFL not just did they take it to the tribunal, they also challenged that, took it to the appeals board. And now in Isaac Heaney's case, where at the end of the day, a, a player's been struck in the head, whether he's you know intended to or not. And it's it's gone through multiple stages here again. It, it feels like, you know, <laughs> we've had the Swans very careful at the start of the year and sort of choosing their words when it comes to you know, incidents involving the head. And then later in the year, doing really everything in their power to, to try and get that player off and, and ultimately have, uh, have fallen short again here with their bid, which I don't have an issue with um, with a one-week ban for, for Heaney in this case. Dangerous levels of reason and logic there from Corbin Middlemass. The Swans obviously know Heaney for that clash with the Kangaroos Saturday Arvo. Look out for Callum Mills, though, making his return. Yeah. The round gets underway tonight. Ninth place, Pies hosting Geelong. Collingwood lose Howe and Myercheck. They bring in Jamie Elliott and John Noble, amongst others. But is this the moment Geelong re-emerges as a premiership contender or do you see the Pies getting back into the top eight? Oh, I love that you framed it around Geelong first because it is a huge opportunity for them. They win tonight. They've won three in a row. Chris Scott believes, despite their 7-0 and start to the season, that they're playing their best footy right now. Close tries to soccer it forward. A pin bounce balls the way of Stengel. Hand pass out to Humphreys. Just inside 50. Laces out a kick. Options are plenty. Cameron takes the mark in front of Neil. Hand passes to Blitzab from two metres out. He puts it... About 20 rows back. And as we know, yeah, not just spots in the top eight, but 
spots in the top four are wide open. So a huge chance for the Cats tonight. And yet often, as what happens in Melbourne, so much of the focus is on Collingwood, not just because they're the biggest team in the land, but they're the reigning premiers. And if anything, it's a beautiful matchup for Craig McRae and his men because they're coming up against a team in Geelong who lived to this last year. They were sort of borderline a top eight team at this stage in the season. For the Cats, it fell away in their premiership defence. Are the Pies going to be able to piece it back together with seven rounds left? Uh, and somehow yeah, give, give themselves a chance in September to defend their premiership despite all the injuries that they've had? Uh, or is it going to go the same way that Geelong's premiership defence did and, and really peter out in the back end of the season? If they don't win tonight, Stacky, they need to win four of their last six games, and that includes you know, matches against you know, Brisbane and Sydney still to come, really tough run home. So I feel like it's almost a virtual elimination final tonight for the Pies. Uh, a lot goes on the line. Speaking of high stakes, the Western Bulldogs this weekend, this club is a nuisance to tip. Which version do we get against the Carlton team that's looking to rebound after a surprise loss to the Giants? We get a version without the centre-half back in uh, Liam Jones and without the centre-half forward in Aaron Norton. So immediately, I think that's that's going to hurt the Western Bulldogs' chances. Interestingly, with their team as well. So they also lose James O'Donnell, who plays in that sort of key back position. And they haven't brought in Alex Keith, who's a key defender. He's listed as an emergency. So maybe we see a late change there. Because on the other side of things... There's a certain guy named Harry Mackay and Charlie Kerno that you've got to try and contain. So a little surprising Luke Beveridge at selection to not go with some more key backs given the danger that Carlton's forward line poses, particularly with the, the twin towers there in, in Kerno and Mackay. This is Patrick Cripps's 200th game. He is one of, if not the best captain in the game at the moment in the way that he goes about it. Patrick Cripps, oh, he's the motor <laughs> that makes this team go. He's hot. Kicks it from out wide. And there's nothing this man can't do at the moment. No, I expect the, the Blues to come out breathing fire after their loss last week. And I, I think they'll be too much for the Bulldogs. West Coast v Brisbane. That is Sunday in the wake of Adam Simpson's departure from the Eagles. And when a coach gets sacked, it can make a game wonky. Can you see this as a bit of a banana peel for a line side that's really finding some form? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's not the favoured way. Like, I don't think too many people are going to be tipping the West Coast Eagles, and yet uh, I certainly wouldn't be ruling it out. So three of the last four interim coaches or caretaker coaches in the competition have come in and won. Uh, it was only Andrew McWalter last year that was the outlier in the in the last four. So we have seen that sort of dead cat bounce from teams when they, they get a, uh, a coach sacking in mid-season. So let's see if the West Coast Eagles have that same success under uh, under Jared Schofield. Congratulations to him as well, who, who takes on that job. Super successful coach in, uh, in WAFL 41, three premierships leading Subiaco there, uh, and now gets his opportunity after stints with Port Adelaide, who of course he played with, and then coming to the West Coast Eagles, he'll get uh, seven games to try and impress on the back end of the season. Even without McGovern, that there is still, you look at West Coast lists, Yes, they're struggling, but I don't think they're a two-win team like they've been in recent seasons. I think they're a little better than that. And you look at their spine with Allen and Waterman up front. Yeah, McGovern won't be there this weekend, but ordinarily McGovern and Barris down back. And they've got a midfield trio, including the likes of you know, Harley Reid and Elliot Yo and Tim Kelly. So when they're up and firing, there's a core seven there that you can work around pretty well. And you put in nice little pieces like Duggan and Cole and Liam Rines and All-Australian small forward. And you, you all of a sudden look at it and you think, how have they been so dreadful for such a long period of time with all those guys? And I know injuries are, has been a problem. They didn't handle the COVID situation well, but wouldn't surprise me at all if you know, not just Schofield on the run home, the last seven games to go, but even into next year, that this team can bounce quickly and, and probably win twice as many games as they have in uh, in recent seasons from, from 2025 and beyond. Every single game of Round 18 is live and free on the ABC Listen app. It's a great deal. Corbin Middlemass will be calling the action. Corb, thanks for your time. Anytime. The NRL is underway for the week. Zach Bailey is here to talk about all the action. Zach, let's start with the Wayne Bennett Cup. The Finns beat the Bunnies. But can I just get your read on how much Bennett has actually been doing for Souths, given it's the team he's going to lead in 2025? Well, it's a great narrative. I actually don't know how much truth is to it, and I really enjoyed at Wayne Bennett's press conference ahead of the game. So when, um, South Sydney got one for seven, eight, are they? <laughs> I don't know that, Joel. <laughs> it's only what I read in the papers. That's the narrative, that Wayne is getting to Ben Hornby's ear a fair bit. He is telling people like Jai Arrow, hey, mate, it's time to have shoulder surgery now because I want you to be fit for next year. It also, this narrative coincides with, or the South's run of form until the loss against the Dolphins coincided with Cam Murray's return, Latrell Mitchell returning. So there's a bit more to it. 
But there's no doubt Wayne would have some sort of an influence. Maybe it, it was even just the players going, hey, Wayne's coming next year. We're all playing for our futures. There's definitely an influence there, but I don't know how much he's actually coaching them day to day. Let's talk about the origin period because it feels so compromised. And I feel like there are two enormous games this week when we apply that lens to them. The 11th place Brisbane Broncos hosting the 10th place Dragons. Which team will miss their rep stars more, Zach? Well, you've got to look at the Broncos right now, and they're really, really struggling at the moment, not only on the origin front, but also with players missing through injury. Jock Madden went down last week, so that's their second string halfback gone, and that's when they really fell away. Reese Walsh was trying to run the show. He's obviously going to be out now. Carrigan, Haas, those kind of players are such big losses. But you look at the Dragons, Ben Hunt, crucial for them and all the success they've had in recent years. I still think, though, Brisbane will miss their players far more. In terms of this game, I spoke to Shane Flanagan this morning. He said, I think it's more of a challenge sometimes when you come up against blokes in similar position that they're out there to you know, prove a point that they are first graders. And the Bron- players the Broncos put in there, will be, they'll, they'll play well, I'm sure. And... Uh, so it's a real challenge for us. Definitely not a banker. The Dragons and Broncos, as you said, plenty to play for tonight. A similar situation as Manly hosts the Knights. You know the Sea Eagles are so strong at Brookvale, but they really battle without Daly Cherry Evans specifically. Tom Trebojevic's centre experimentation lasted just a week, it seems. How important will he and those flimsy hamstrings be to this fixture? Well, it's so important that he gets through the game because I know the fear from Manly or the reason why they played him in the centres for just the one week was the fast acceleration efforts that are required by a fullback. So I don't know whether we will see him take off the mark. It might be in the back of his mind as it was when he's come back from previous hamstring injuries. The big win there is that that he is playing and he's not playing for New South Wales. All the pressure will be on Luke Brooks because when Manly played against South Sydney a couple of weeks ago, he didn't orchestrate and lead the team like many expected him to. So there's a fair bit of pressure on him to be the number one chief playmaker, something he's struggled with in the past. But in terms of origin players, look at the Knights. Ahead of game three, they've got Bradman Best, Kalen Ponga and Dane Gagai, who haven't been part of the series previously, are all missing. So in terms of swings, it all swings to Manly. They need a big win at home to break free of that lock jam in the middle of the ladder cracking weekend of rugby league coming your way. Zach Bailey, thanks for previewing the best of it. Can't wait. Thank you, Pat. Time for sound bites. Isaac Heaney was not the only New South Wales based AFL player in trouble this week. Giant skipper Toby Green copped another fine and much like Heaney's sombre statement he had one of his own. Hey guys, obviously pretty shattered to get fined again over the weekend. I just wanted to jump on here and give a heartfelt sorry to uh, all the Giants fans and the wide AFL community along with my family. I can guarantee one thing is that it will not happen again. That'll be tough. And I'll promise to pay the fine all by myself. I'll do everything I can to make sure this year is a special one. Again, thank you all for your support. Seems genuine and not at all pointed at their crosstown rivals. Uh Uh-uh, no. Tennis is an emotional game and Australian Jordan Thompson learned that the hard way as he tried to respectfully argue his case with a chair umpire. Yeah, but you called it late. No, no, no. You called it after the point. Yeah, but I have to have to replay the point. What are you talking about? The point's over. (sighs) Okay. well, I really would love to say some terrible stuff to you right now because that's the worst ball I've ever seen. And it mattered not. Thompson and his doubles partner Max Purcell are through to the men's doubles final and you can hear that on the ABC Listen app. Remember when Rory McIlroy had an absolute melt in the final round of the US Open? Well, he's finally fronted the press and addressed the heavy criticism he received from, well, all of us really. At the end of the day, they're not there. They're not in the arena, they're not the ones that are hitting the shots and making the decisions. And someone said to me once, if if you would never if you would never take advice from these people, then you wouldn't you, you'd never take their criticisms either. So I certainly wouldn't go to Hank Kenny for advice. Burn. It's a deep burn. And if you thought that we were done with the presidential golf chat, think again. I'm also officially challenging Cricket Joe to an 18 hole golf match right here. Under Al's Blue Monster, considered one of the greatest tournament golf courses anywhere in the world, one of the great courses of the world. It will be among the most watched sporting events in history. 
may be bigger than the Ryder Cup or even the Masters. You can find lots of things on the ABC Listen app. I don't think you'll find that blockbuster matchup just yet. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, produced by Poppy Penny. Thanks to Stan Sport, Newsmax and the Giants for the extra audio used in this episode. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.